Thank you. Um, okay, so my, my talk will be about uh, disordered systems, so systems with quench disorder. And so this is an ongoing work. But uh, this time we were interested, so uh, with uh, Yvon Balog, who is here, and, and Mathieu Tissier in Paris, uh, we were interested by um, the dynamics in equilibrium, meaning around equilibrium, and the dynamics out of equilibrium of those systems. Uh, of course, dynamics uh, on large scales, long times, so this is collective events. And more specifically, uh, we want to focus on a class of systems, um, statistical physics, condensed matter theory, so this is a, a broad spectrum of, of physical realizations that I will not uh, detail, um, for which the long distance physics is dominated by uh, disorder. Disorder fluctuations rather than thermal fluctuations, and I will give uh, some explanation for that. Um, so those systems are uh, models in a random field, random field being random magnetic field, uh, for if it's a local mag magnetization, which is coupled to this field. Uh, it could be a random chemical potential. Generally speaking, it's a random source that is linearly coupled, so to uh, the local order parameter. It could be also models, ON models, with a random anisotropy, or it could be also a, a class of uh, interfaces, so elastic manifolds, uh, in a random environment. So those are the, the systems we're interested in. And the dominance of quench disorder means this. That is, when you consider equilibrium, uh, it means that the, the critical behavior is controlled by a zero temperature fixed point. That is, even if the critical behavior is at finite temperature, so this is, for instance, uh, a sketch of the phase diagram of a random field model above the, the lower critical dimension. So we have temperature here. You have disorder strength here. And this is the critical line separated paramagnetic from a ferromagnetic phase in a, a magnetic language. Um, and then every point here, except, of course, the purizing case, which is in zero, exactly zero disorder, every point here flows to zero temperature and finite disorder fixed point. So in that case, um, everything about criticality is dominated by the sample to sample, the quench disorder fluctuations. and in, for such fixed points at zero temperature, there's an additional exponent that controls how the temperature flows to zero. So the renormalized temperature, of course not the bare temperature, but the renormalized temperature flows to zero, to the fixed point, and this gives an additional exponent that enters all sorts of uh, equalities between, between critical exponents. Uh, so this exponent theta is strictly positive, which means that indeed uh, temperature is irrelevant. Now, what is interesting for the dynamics is that um, the dynamics here, I'm talking about equilibrium, uh, the dynamics, the relaxation to equilibrium at finite temperature in, in those cases, that is around the critical point, so the standard critical slowing down, is in fact very different from usual. So usually you have a power law relation uh, between uh, time scale and length scale with the dynamical exponent z. Well, here it turns out that just because uh, the temperature is irrelevant, you have an exponential relation. So I put the temperature here just for uh, bookkeeping. It's not really in, uh, important. An exponential relation between time, the time for relaxing the system to equilibrium, and uh, the uh, uh, length scale, meaning that the relaxation uh, to equilibrium is extremely slow. So that's a special feature of that type of uh, system, which, you know, say sometimes it's sort, sort of glassy uh, dynamics. Now, because it's so slow, that means that there is also uh, non-trivial physics at very low temperature. That is, at very low temperature, you can basically forget about relaxation to equilibrium. And the only thing that you can still do, which is highly non-trivial in the presence of disorder, is that you can drive your system, you know, by applying uh, an external field, generally speaking, a uh, force, and then you drive your system out of equilibrium, and this leads to, in the case of interfa uh, interfaces, this leads to the physics of pinning of interfaces and depinning transition, and in the case, more generally in the case of random fields, random anisotropy, you have a hysteresis phenomenon and out of equilibrium phase transitions. So this is um, 
general features of those models. Now, um, why do we need, I will go pretty fast here because first I have only 20 minutes and I guess some of this we, we talked uh, in, in the past. Um, why do we need um, non-perturbative functional renormalization group here? So, so the two terms in that case are, I take them as distinct, uh, unless what we do generally in the field. Um, well, the, the renormalization group in that case must be functional because um, if you think of the physics, which is related to uh, the presence of all those impurities, well, the physics is dominated by rare events, rare regions, rare samples, uh, which have the name at zero temperature of avalanches or shocks. So these are collective events that take place at zero temperature and in, in real space. Um, at finite temperature, you have um, low energy excitations that are uh, uh, considered as or known as uh, droplets. Again, that is something which is induced by the disorder and that you see in real space. Now, the problem is how to uh, keep the signature of those events in the renormalization group. You know, it's not easy uh, to work directly with those objects because, of course, in the presence of random impurities, quench disorder, well, you lose translational invariance. So that means that, you know, uh, generating functional here uh, as a function of the source is a random object. And of course, it's a whole mess if you try to renormalize a random object because you need to renormalize a probability functional of the thing, and that's so far basically uh, impossible. So what you do, of course, is that you can work with the cumulants of the random functionals in general, and those cumulants, of course, you can access uh, in, in a theory when you recover a translational invariance. So you're happy, you're working with cumulants, but the question is, okay, I have cumulants, but then how can I keep track of those events in real space that are pretty rare? And the key point is that to describe this, you need the dependence of the cumulants on their arguments, because it's the singular dependence of the cumulants on their arguments that capture the physics of those events. So that means that to describe the physics, you need to be functional just uh, to get that singular dependence and that signature of those rare events. Um, now, why do we need to be non-perturbative? Well, first there is a general reason is that the standard perturbation theory just breaks down completely, and this is the problem that it will not address of the uh, uh, dimensional reduction failure. But more than that, there is also this, this point that for random fields and for random anisotropy models, uh, well, you have a change of behavior, so the physics drastically changes at a non-trivial uh, critical dimension. And here, for instance, I, I plot a phase diagram, which would be for the random field ON model, so you have at the vertical axis is the number of components n from Ising to large numbers. And here it's the number of dimensions. So six is the upper critical dimensions. Um, two is the lower critical dimensions for Ising, four the lower critical dimensions for, for uh, uh, the Heisenberg and others. And you see that there is a, a red line here which goes down to about 5.1 for the Ising case in terms of dimension. Uh, that separates two different regions where the physics changes. That is, below here, really you need the strong uh, non-analyticity of the, uh, the, the, the dependence, the functional dependence of the cumulants. Uh, you have a dominance of the avalanches, you have dimensional reduction breakdown, and you have supersymmetry uh, breaking at the same time. So there is really a change of behavior, and of course it's a non-trivial dimension, so there's no way even a very clever uh, perturbative functional RG uh, will give you this directly. Uh, okay, so this is, this is the motivation for uh, using a non-perturbative functional RG for uh, those systems, and from now on I will focus on, on the random field Ising model, so the n, n equals one version uh, in a random field. Now, um, 
The physics is that, in, in and out of equilibrium. So consider here the system at zero temperature. Okay, so this is the plane. Uh, phi is the magnetization, say, and J is the, uh, the source, the applied source. And now you can consider uh, the equilibrium problem. So what you would do is just look at the ground state. In, it's at zero temperature. And, and look at you know, what's the, the behavior of the magnetization in the ground state. And for that value of the disorder, uh, the magnetization, which is the blue line, has a discontinuous jump. So there's a first order transition. We are then below the critical disorder. And this is a first order transition. And the system has, has the, the usual uh, Z2 uh, symmetry. Now, what you can also do, uh, do is um, Consider the system at zero temperature, but now drive it with the magnetic field. So instead of waiting or trying to use tricks to equilibrate your system, you say, forget equilibration. I drive the system by just ramping up, for instance, here, the magnetic field, or if you wish now, ramping down the magnetic field and following the magnetization. Now, of course, I'm no longer in the ground state. I will stay in metastable states, some special metastable states of the system that are still locally stable, but not the full ground state. And I will have this hysteresis curve with an ascending uh, branch when I ramp up the field and a descending branch when I ramp down the field. And what happens is that if, you, if I do this very slowly, so in a quasi-static limit, uh, what happens is that there is also phase transition along the hysteresis branches. So for instance, at this disorder, there is indeed a critical point here that will separate a region where the hysteresis is smooth with a region where it has also a jump, a first order transition. And as you see, now the Z2 symmetry is broken locally because I'm in the field. But of course, it is recovered uh, on the other branch, that is this branch has a symmetry compared to that branch. So you have a critical point here, but you have also a critical point here. Uh, but what we're interested in is, say, choose one of those branches and study the critical behavior of uh, uh, one of those branches. So this is something which is you know, important for technology, all those hysteresis and uh, uh, business in disordered systems. Uh, but what is interesting here is that um, it's a long, uh, there's been a long debate about uh, What's the, uh, the nature of the critical point uh, in and out of equilibrium? And simulations, all sorts of clever simulations with pretty large system sizes, uh, show that, quite surprisingly, uh, when you look at the critical exponents and the scaling functions of the two systems, the critical system out of equilibrium and the critical system in equilibrium, uh, you find you know, very, very close exponents and very, very similar uh, scaling functions. And so the idea was that, well, maybe, of course, it's very different situations. This one is out of equilibrium, has no Z2 symmetry uh, uh, compared to the other one, but maybe they are controlled by the same fixed point. And of course, simulations will never answer this because, you know, it's, you would need a precision that is uh, enormous, and even then we would not even possibly be convinced. But of course, you can do an RG calculation and see, indeed, if the two critical conditions flow toward the same fixed point or if they flow to uh, different fixed points. And this is uh, the main question that I will uh, address uh, today. Now, there's also different effects of, of temperature in and out of equilibrium. So as I said, when you are around equilibrium, you put a little bit of temperature, and first the phase transition is not destroyed. It's still there. And you have this activated dynamic scaling with very slow relaxation. Uh, when you put temperature uh, out of equilibrium on the hysteresis curve, well, of course, in practice, in an experiment, you see nothing. Because as I said, the time scale for relaxation is so large, it, you see nothing. But when you do statistical mechanics and you assume that you have an infinite time scale at your disposal to equilibrate or change, of course, it changes everything. So if you want this uh, uh, behavior out of equilibrium with phase transitions out of equilibrium, it's the same for depending transition of interfaces, is truly defined uh, rigorously only at zero temperature. 
Uh, okay, so this is a problem of equilibrium versus metastability that is well known otherwise. Uh, now, what's the model? So we're looking at the dynamics of the random field Ising model and um, looking at you know, long distance, uh, long time, so we're using a field theoretical description, and we're starting from a Langevin equation where the field, so the scalar field at uh, uh, point x and time t, uh, obeys the Langevin equation uh, here where this is the force which is due to uh, the standard ferromagnetic action, so the standard phi 4 action for the pure system. Um, then you have a term that does not depend on time, which is the random field. And usually, for simplicity, take it as Gaussian uh, uh, with a, a variance here, which, which gives the, uh, the bare strength of the disorder. Um, then you have an applied source, J of t. And then you have thermal noise, stochastic noise, uh, which is also taken, as usual, as Gaussian, uh, with a variance which is given by the temperature. Okay, so at zero temperature, basically, this term is uh, not relevant. Now, J of t is, is the applied source, meaning that you have two settings. You're looking at your system at equilibrium, then, of course, the source is just constant. It's what it is. And actually, to look at the phase transition, you even uh, look at uh, a source which is equal to zero, no source. Now, for the quasi-statically driven system at zero temperature, then your source actually is, as I said, slowly ramped up or down in time. So the uh, omega here, uh, the rate goes to zero, but it goes either, and this is important, it goes either to zero plus, of course you ramp up, so even if you're quasi-static, so it's almost a static calculation, but you should keep track of the fact that you're going forward in a sense, and your field, your magnetic field, and your magnetizations are going up. But you could also look at a different uh, case, which is, of course, the descending branch, and now omega would go to zero minus, and in that case, it would be the other way around. The magnetic field uh, decreases, albeit very slowly, and the magnetizations also decreases. So this is very important, this sort of irreversible behavior that you have out of equilibrium, which is quite different uh, from, uh, uh, from equilibrium. Anyhow, we introduce, uh, we introduce copies, replicas, because uh, this is uh, something that we like to generate cumulants. We use the Johnson, the Dominicis, Martin, CGRO's formalism to write this in terms of uh, generating functional with response field. And what we get is a dynamical action okay, that has a term which is independent of disorder. It's the same that you would have for the dynamics of, of just the Ising model or the phi 4 theory. And a term which is, which is with two uh, copies, two cumulants, a second cumulant which depends on the Bayer disorder. You add an infrared regulator, you do the usual trick, you Fourier transform, you get the scale-dependent effective action, you write down the exact equation that we all know here, and, and then we're uh, in principle done, except of course that we need an uh, approximation scheme. And the appro approximation scheme here is uh, derivative expansions, so in gradients in time, and in space, so this is again standard, uh, has been done. And we need also an expansion in cumulants, as I said. And so we need also to truncate in cumulants. And so what we do is that, at least for this model, for other models who truncate at higher orders, uh, so you have a first cumulant with, you see, functions, so this, this uh, just local, this is something that gives us the uh, renormalization of, of the wave function renormalization, a dynamical coefficient. And what is important here is this second cumulant, renormalized cumulant of the random field that depends, as you see, on, on two arguments. Um, again, you know, we can use scaling dimensions and put all this in dimensionless forms, and we get then the flow equations that we have to look at and to solve. Uh, the whole point, which is, which is central here in the dynamics, is that since we have at the fixed point, at least, um, a non-analytic, a singular uh, action, effective action, so remember the delta, which is the, uh, the second cumulant of the random field, has a cusp. 
when you go to the fixed point, a cusp in the difference between the fields. Okay, so when the two fields becomes equal, there is a singular behavior, so the function should be symmetric. It is symmetric, but it's now symmetric with a cusp. Okay, and this is the singularity that keeps track of the avalanches in the problem uh, when we are below that dimension 5.1. But the problem now is that the flow equations are ambiguous because the flow equations need derivatives of this function evaluated at the same, for the same replicas. And of course, for the same replicas, well, it depends if you're on one side or on the other, so there is an ambiguity. And that's a whole problem that is the same also in the case of interfaces in random environment for the perturbative functional origin. Now, the way to resolve this is that in equilibrium, in fact, as soon as you put a little bit of temperature, in fact, the cusp is rounded. So the cusp here has a little rounding due to temperature of, of a width that goes to zero with temperature, but it's rounded. So basically, it lifts the ambiguity. So you can take derivatives, and then you take the limit of temperature goes to zero. It's not that easy, OK, because it's, it's a non-uniform convergence, so you have to be careful. But it lifts the ambiguity. And indeed, you go back to the zero temperature fixed point, because again, the temperature goes to zero. And that's the way you get also activated dynamic scaling that I will not discuss now. For hysteresis at t equals zero, so you cannot add temperature, then there's no rounding. So here you're in trouble. But the way to solve this is to remember that we had this infinitesimal rate of time for driving, which translates into an infinitesimal velocity for the change of the, the magnetization. And again, the fact that the system is irreversible, that is, when you drive up, the magnetization goes up. When you drive down, the magnetization goes down. Well, basically, to make a very long story short, I mean, I must say that the first time we got, we got it wrong, so it's not that easy. Um, but basically, what, what it does is that it selects one side or the other. So even in the presence of a cusp, the fact that you have this uh, irreversible behavior, you know, with causality and everything, uh, makes that you can choose in your flow equations derivative on one side or the other, and it's no longer ambiguous. So you have flow equations now that you can solve, non-ambiguous for equilibrium, out of equilibrium, and they are different. And indeed, what we find is that the fixed points are different uh, in and out of equilibrium when you are below uh, that special dimensions uh, where uh, the cusp appears, which is about 5.1. Um, now, just to show you that they are different, let me just point this, this function here that is the, the renormalization, the wave function renormalization function as a function of the field. So the red is in equilibrium, so you see the nice inversion symmetry, the Z2 symmetry as a function of the field it's for dimension 4.1, and the black one is the hysteresis fixed point. So you see they are clearly different, the fixed points. There's no, no uh, way to, to confuse them. On the other hand, uh, when you look here at the anomalous dimensions, so it turns out that there are two anomalous dimensions, well, the full lines are the, uh, our predictions for the equilibrium case. And you see that the symbols here are our predictions. So far, we can't go uh, much uh, down here. It's a kind of technical, numerical, uh, bothering problem, but it's not, nothing uh, 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 fundamental. Uh, you see that they are very, very close. They are different, though, okay? So there is a slight difference. And when you see the exponent, the other exponents, there is also a slight difference, those two. So we have, basically, it's our answer. Um, we have different fixed points. But indeed, for some reason, uh, the critical exponents look uh, very similar uh, between equilibrium and out of equilibrium. So I guess this is, this is the sort of answer that I guess you can reasonably have from uh, that non-perturbative RG, but that you couldn't have from any sort of simulation because, as you see, the difference is so small in the simulation don't uh, compute directly uh, the, uh, the functions we are looking at. Anyhow, so those, those are uh, the conclusions. Uh, let's say that to check this, so as you say, the numbers are pretty good. I, I didn't uh, stress this. 
for that model, but we checked this on the other model of interfaces in, the, in a random environment where there are much more, uh, many more data on that. And again, we get good results and good agreement uh, with uh, the, the existing uh, data. So we're pretty confident now on, on this result, but this, uh, you know, there's still a way, a long way to, to go anyhow. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>